This is the second module uh, of the Gospel of Mary and Magdalenic Gnosis. Here we're going to consider the legends and the probable history of Mary Magdalene. We call this In Quest of the Historical Miriam of Magdala. Now we know that uh, Mary's main claim to fame in the Gentile uh, Christian Gospels, w which were written during the first period of the marginalization of women, was that uh, it was she who was the first witness of the resurrection. And that's the last thing we hear about Mary, except possibly in one of the uh, epistles of Paul, who refers to a Mary in Rome. Now, we have, however, many legends that have sprung up around Mary Magdalene because of this mysterious disappearance in later years as people look back. And the legend of the Magdalene in France or in Gaul is part of the medieval lives of the saints or what's called as the, the, the golden legend that Mary Magdalene came to Gaul, came to France. And these stories were compiled in the 13th century by the Archbishop of Genoa. And you can read them many places. You can read them online and many other kinds of... The so-called golden legend um, goes like this. Uh, Mary Magdalene came with Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, and with Maximim, Sidon, and Marcella, and they were all set adrift by the evil Jews in a vessel without sails or oars or rudder uh, with the idea, the idea that they would float to their doom in the Mediterranean Sea. <coughs> Providence brought them, however, safely to uh, Marseille, the harbor at Marseille. And against pagan opposition, they converted people to Christianity, and Maximum became the first bishop of that area. And Mary retired to live for 35 years as a penitent hermit in stony caves of Sambon, where she daily bewailed her sins, and people thought she had died. She, in this place, ate only the Eucharist, which was supplied to her by angels, and she was transported upwards into heaven and heard celestial choruses all these years that she was repenting. Uh, this was finally witnessed by an old man, an old saint, who reported to the villagers what he saw. Finally, uh, she died, and she was carried bodily, assumed bodily into heaven by angels at her death. Now, here is the traditional location of the cave of, of uh, St. Mary Magdalene at saint Balm. Uh It would be in these cliffs in ancient Gaul or in France. <coughs> this is the Basilica of Maximum and the convent of saint Balm. Uh, this is uh, named after the first historical bishop in the region and the legend says that he came over with Mary Magdalene and there were supposedly remains of saints here and so on. And it's uh, at this convent that many traditions about the Magdalene are, uh, are preserved and they have been for ever since the, thir the 13th and 14th centuries, some of the oldest traditions we have. And uh, one of my good friends, uh, Bishop Rosamund Miller, who is head of a Gnostic church in Palo Alto, uh, was uh, spent many years at this convent where she became um, one of the three hierophants of the order of uh, Mary Magdalene and uh, preserves the traditions they had there at St. Baum. <coughs> now, let's take a look at... Uh, Mary Magdalene. She was always presented as a harlot saint and she wears a red or scarlet color. Here we have a medieval portrayal of great saints. The first is Saint Magdalene. She is dressed in scarlet representing sexual sins. And the second is Saint Odelia of the 7th century. She was a monastic founder and uh, 
uh, her blindness was cured and she could read books and that's why she's represented here as the second female saint with a book. And here is uh, St. Clair who is the associate of St. Francis of Assisi, uh, uh, brother, son, sister, moon fame and so on. Now as we look at the medieval legends of uh, Mary Magdalene, I'm looking at a, uh, a series of paintings about Mary Magdalene that I found some photographs of on the web that we might take a look at. Here in the top left uh, segment, we find the repentant Mary drying Jesus' feet with her hair. This is, this is the, the association that was made of Mary Magdalene in the 4th century, 5th century by a Christian bishop who decided that the anonymous prostitute uh, who, uh, who washed uh, Yeshua's feet with her tears and her hair must have been Mary Magdalene. And so here she is represented in her scarlet robes. Uh, we have on another part of the panel uh, Jesus raising uh, Mary's brother Lazarus. That would be Mary of Bethany, who is confused, by the way, in the medieval period with Mary Magdalene, from the tomb. And so here we can certainly have no problem identifying which one is Mary Magdalene. That would be the lady in scarlet. But, uh, of course, it really was Mary of Bethany, not Mary Magdalene. We find the, the two Marys confused. And here in the lower bottom left, we have Mary meets Jesus after his resurrection. And uh, we, we know for sure who it is. She's in scarlet. And Mary preaches the gospel. Now, this is, uh, this is very interesting because there's no tradition in the uh, New Testament of Mary going out and preaching the gospel. But she is shown in this uh, particular tradition as preaching the gospel, of course, dressed in scarlet. So she's always in scarlet. Mary Magdalene is, is, our, is the saint we love to love because she represents the repressed sexual. And so we want to keep her a harlot if we can possibly do so. We want to keep her a prostitute and all this sort of thing. But, you know, history doesn't really indicate that she was any such thing. <coughs> now, if we look at the portrait of Mary as a young woman, a, a young lady, here's Cosimo's portrait. This can give us a lot of insight into the legends that evolved. You might see next to her the alabaster jar. She is now confused with Mary of Bethany. Because the Mary uh, that is the scarlet Mary, the Mary who is uh, probably even bears the child of Jesus and the th theories of the bloodline and so on, uh, is the Mary that uh, comes through the Merovingian Holy Bloodline legend, which I've referred to before. The Merovingians were the rulers in Gaul, the long-haired rulers, who uh, claimed in the 5th century that their line had been established by the son of Jesus Christ himself, the illegitimate son uh, that was brought over to France by Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene already had been uh, considered to be in France by certain legends uh, uh, at that time, but the earliest is this Merovingian legend. And according to this, <coughs> she was brought to France by the wealthy merchant Joseph of Arimathea, and she was pregnant with the child of Jesus. And the child became then the progenitor of the entire Merovingian dynasty. Now, they don't tell us anything about who the kings and rulers were in the 1st century, 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, they all of a sudden just start up in the 5th century. Like many legends, there's no root to it. Uh, but the long-haired Merovingian kings kept their power over the people and kept their opponents afraid to attack them or to engage in battle with them because they were considered to be invincible, having the blood of Jesus in their veins. <coughs> well, nevertheless, they were defeated by the Carolingians, that is the dynasty established by the bastard son, uh, Charles the Great Charlemagne himself, who was a great uh, warrior and great leader of men. In the ninth, ninth century, in, the, in, in AD 800 at Christmas, he was given the title of Royal 
of the uh, Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope. So they were defeated, uh, and uh, Charlemagne was able to drive out the Moorish conquerors who had started coming into Spain and were threatening uh, Roman Catholicism and, and all the rest in Spain. <coughs> And in order to gain the uh, allegiance of the uh, French or Gaulish people and the tribal people who uh, were very, very much in awe of the Merovingian holy bloodline, uh, the Carolingians developed their own holy bloodline items, the first of which was uh, the foreskin of Jesus, which was uh, kept in a golden reliquary and uh, so on. And later on, in <coughs> compacts made with the papacy, uh, the Eucharist itself was considered to be the holy blood of Jesus. And so the, the elevation of the Eucharist even more than, uh, than it had been in the first century. In the first century, it was, it was considered to be the body and blood of the Christ. Uh, but the, this became the blood of Jesus, the blood of Christ, the holy blood, holy grail. And so therefore... For the kings and the descendants of Charlemagne, the connection with the Catholic Church was very important because it was their holy bloodline. And that's why Catholicism became so powerful among the uh, royal families, because the royal families of Europe, by and large, descended from the generals and rulers of the armies of Charlemagne, and that was the basis of European nobility. And so the connection between the nobility and the church was established and the Holy Bloodline, uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail Bloodline was established, uh, f taken off of its root with the Merovingian concept. Uh, so this alliance served uh, these ruling families in Europe very well for quite a while. <coughs> now, there had to be some uh, bones thrown to the dogs after the establishment of the Carolingian dynasty, and one of the things that was done, because it was such a, a major thing in the, uh, uh, among the, the population of people, among the uh, peasantry, among the various kinds of religious groups that were not uh, Catholic, they were considered to be heretical, and uh, among the common people of the area, were very much uh, made the Merovingian bloodline their, their kind of common cause and their common cry and their common myth. And uh, in order to uh, kind of throw a bone to all those interests that were out there that were the kind of the counter to the papal and Carolingian, uh, a Merovingian uh, successor, one of the, uh, one of the uh, great, great grandchildren of the Merovingian line was given uh, what was called the Priory of Zion in Jerusalem, sitting right on top of uh, the place where the ancient... Uh, uh, temple had been, and uh, this prior Zion became a, a quite a uh, quite a mythological place, and and much myth has developed as a result of that, and ideas about the prior Zion being a secret society and all this sort of thing. Uh, but it was uh, given that small bit of territory was given to be ruled by the uh, the person who was the legitimate Merovingian successor. And so the Holy Bloodline legend became perpetuated in all kinds of anti-papal communities like the Albigensians, that is the Cathari, and the Bogomiles, and so on. And it became a subject in art. We find it uh, uh, kept going in the uh, sort of the, the underground stream of uh, esoteric uh, medieval uh, communities and ideas. For example, even in Da Vinci's Last Supper, uh, we have the bloodline legend perpetuated among European mystics. Here we have uh, Mary Magdalene sitting at the meal, the Last Supper, with Yeshua. Of course, she's not mentioned at all in that context in the, in the Gospels. Here we have some scenes from the life of Mary Magdalene. This is by uh, Giovanni da Milano, a 14th century uh, fresco from a chapel in Florence. And what do we have here? Is this the Holy Bloodline legend? Here's a, a, a boat, 
a rudderless boat arriving in uh, in Europe in this one panel and here we have uh, Mary on lying down Mary Magdalene giving birth to a little Jesus baby here so you see the Merovingian concept of holy blood holy grail type of thing uh, was something that was perpetuated in legend and myth and it was believed by many people but it was not uh, accepted as doctrine by the the Catholic Church and it in fact was not historical it was legendary so let's look at the historical Miriam the historical Mary of Magdala and let's start out by looking at Magdala where it was and what it was like Magdala was a, uh, a community that sat below great bluffs and cliffs on the Sea of Galilee it was a fishing community and their greatest commodity was fish that they caught and dried and salted and it was a staple for people all over and in fact considered to be a delicacy in many places and it was kind of a smelly place uh, Miriam uh, seems to have been a self-supporting widow she seems to have been married to somebody who was rather wealthy uh, and that he had died and instead of taking a new husband she seemed to have been a very independent sort of woman here is a uh, a mosaic that uh, is uh, taken from the area that sort of shows the ships with oars and sails out fishing in the sea and bringing their catch to Magdala. <coughs> now the town disappeared very soon uh, in history. Uh, this is all that remains is a bunch of rocks and stones but off in the distance here we see a place where tombs were once for the city where people were entombed and uh, so y as you can see it was right on the the line of the water and of the Sea of Galilee if we were to look at Magdala from the Sea of Galilee this is what we'd see great cliffs and bluffs overseeing it this is actually a place where uh, where there were battles or where people uh, during the conflicts with the Romans would uh, climb high up into the cliffs and uh, 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 battle the Romans below or where there were earlier wars that were uh, fought with uh, great battlefields and uh, these cliffs that we see uh, were the high uh, bluffs uh, behind the city of Magdala Now the city of Tiberias is what grew and became a really important place for trade. Here we have a, a picture from the last century of people on donkeys uh, carrying merchants, carrying some things past a uh, what is uh, seems to be a fallen tower. Uh, the word Migdal means tower and what remains of that area is actually called Migdal. Here's a view of uh, m uh, more of a 20th century view of Tiberias. It's a much uh, larger place. It's a black and white picture that was taken about 80 years ago. But it's no longer on the site of uh, Magdala, but it was the closest place to Magdala. And Migdal, as I say, is probably named from uh, the remains of a tower. So uh, uh, possibly Magdal, Magdala is the place of the tower. <coughs> now what about the relationship between Miriam and Yeshua? The relationship between Mary and Jesus. She is, we know, the first witness of the resurrection and has the first revelatory conversation with the risen Jesus. And that we, as we said before, this becomes the hallmark of secret gnosis and uh, we also know of a unique intimacy that existed between them from many sources and we know that Peter and other male apostles opposed Mary from many sources we know that by the time we get into the AD 70s and so on that Luke's gospel says Jesus cast seven devils out of her which implies that she was possessed or somehow uh, unclean 
And this is a typical slander to marginalize her because she was a woman and it was at that time that women were being literally uh, dispossessed of their authority in the church. Uh, three centuries later, uh, to review what we've already talked about, a pope declared Mary Magdalene the same person as the anonymous repentant prostitute, and that put her in her place. So, uh, all we know is that there was uh, a very important and intimate relationship between the, t uh, between the two, between Miriam and Yeshua. There had been all kinds of speculation about it, uh, but uh, this is uh, kind of the basis for all that speculation. There is no doubt, however, that Yeshua uh, considered Miriam to be a favorite person. Uh, if one could say that Yeshua favored people, he considered her to be very highly beloved and close to him. In the Gospel of Philip, we read this. As for the wisdom who was called the barren, that would be, this would be a <coughs> an encomium about virginity, she is the mother of the angels, and the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene. And now this word companion is a very important term. It doesn't mean wife. It means the equal. It means somebody who is the uh, uh, the partner of someone. It's a very high term. But Christ loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on the mouth. The rest of the disciples were offended by it and expressed disapproval. They said to him, Why do you love her more than all of us? And the Savior answered and said to them, Why do I not love you like her? When a blind man and one who sees are together in the darkness, they are no different from one another. When the light comes, then he who sees will see the light, and he who is blind will remain in the darkness. Well, this is the explanation we find for the love that Yeshua had for Miriam. Miriam is, is compared to one who sees. Now, this would indicate that she was the most gifted of the disciples. And uh, many have decided that she may have been the original beloved disciple of John's Gospel. She's referred to in several other pieces of literature this way as the beloved, special beloved of Jesus. The word used, companion, does not mean wife and it does not mean lover. It's, uh, it's a, an entirely different kind of word. Now the Gospel of Mary uh, we read there, Peter says to Mary, Sister, we know that the Savior, Savior loved you more than the rest of women, or the rest of women. In the Gospel of Thomas, uh, we have a saying that was uh, added to the original collection at a later date. Simon Peter said to them, Make Mary leave us, for females don't deserve divine life. And Jesus said, Look, I will guide her to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now this is a late saying. This is not a really original one, but it is obviously at a time when uh, women are being marginalized and the, the, uh, the rather well-known uh, opposition of Peter to Mary and her authority uh, is being addressed in this rather early uh, bit of literature. Uh, as we remember from the earlier module, Paul referred to women church leaders with male terms. He referred to them with male forms, even male pronouns uh, of, of Greek words. And the beloved disciple in John's Gospel is always considered to be male because male terms are used. Um, the tradition of the Gospel of Thomas portrays Mary Magdalene as a unique and worthy woman who is trained and guided by Yeshua. And Mary Magdalene is prominent in all kinds of other Gnostic and non-Gnostic early Christian literature as foremost of the seven classic uh, or traditional women disciples. So she is credited with uh, seeing the risen Christ at the tomb as being the first one who sees him, but 
more important, and this uh, is not stated in the Gospels, she has the first vision of the risen Christ, and she has the first conversation, revelatory conversation. Uh, later on, according to Paul, 500 more disciples, including Paul, will have had conversation with or instruction from the risen Christ. Uh, now, there are many later claims of Gnostics, of their leaders to have had revelations and to have written down revelations from the risen Christ. So one would have to ask, how many more visions did Miriam have? Miriam could have had many more visions of the risen Christ. She could have had much dialogue with the Savior. And the Gospel of Mary, however, tells us of a pre-crucifixion uh, uh, and not a post-resurrection ascent that Mary herself makes under the guidance of Yeshua. This is not a Gnostic claim. This is not something that is based on the uh, uh, vision of Yeshua after his crucifixion. This is something that happens during the life of Yeshua where Mary is taken onto an ascent into the higher worlds. In other words, a Merkaba ascent, a form of Merkaba mysticism, before Jesus is crucified, while he's alive, while he's living. And this is entirely different than the claims made in any other kind of Gnostic literature about uh, uh, mysteries learned from the risen Christ. So this is indeed a very different kind of uh, revelation we're looking at with the Gospel of Mary. Now Mary is not mentioned as part of the Jerusalem church. Why is that so? Why is it the writer of Luke and Acts does not mention Mary? Uh, well, we know that from several sources that uh, Yeshua tells his apostles, his disciples, that he will go before them into Galilee, and it is there in Galilee that he will first appear. He will appear to his apostles and his disciples in Galilee, quite far away from Jerusalem. And it's probably quite likely that... Uh, Miriam, Mary of Magdala, returned to her hometown or other regions of the Galilee after the resurrection. She did not stay in Jerusalem with Peter and John and the others. There is no mention of her in the uh, Luke and Acts, which centered mostly on the Jerusalem church and the primacy of Peter and Paul. But indeed, that was not all that was going on. We tend to think that the early church was one little cluster in Jerusalem, not so at all because the main body of the teaching of Yeshua was around uh, the Sea of Galilee, and that community was much farther north, and there were many, many people uh, in that community uh, who were uh, disciples and apostles of Yeshua. Now, it's a common theme that we find in early Christian literature that tells us that Peter rejected Mary's leadership. In fact, she might have been uh, his main competition for leadership in the early church. She saw the Christ risen. He only saw the empty tomb. It is likely that she conducted her apostolic ministry among the house churches of Galilee, and that's where she was. That's why we don't find her as in the book of the Acts as part of the Jerusalem church. Uh, now, if we look at Peter's missionary journey, so to speak, they're mainly along the coastal trade route uh, that connects Jerusalem to Caesarea through Lydda and Joppa, which was, by the way, first evangelized by Philip. And we know that 12 years after this, later, she travels to Ephesus in Asia Minor with the Apostle John, 12 years later. There are also many legends of her being in Rome. Uh, according to well-documented Eastern Orthodox traditions, this is what the historical Mary Magdalene did. And it's the probable history that's accepted by most scholars. And it appears that John accepted Mary's authority. She would have been the age of his mother, and he would have accepted her authority as one who really understood the higher mysteries of Yeshua, and that's why they traveled together. Now let's take a look at the regional ministries of Miriam and Peter. 
Now, Peter's ministry was mostly in Judea and around Jerusalem. That's where he stayed. In fact, this is the area that he covers, according to information we have from the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, he goes to Lydda and Joppa and as far north as Caesarea. Now, Miriam's ministry, I am uh, positing, is around her hometown and around the hometown of Jesus, the mother of uh, Jesus that would have lived in Nazareth. Cana, Capernaum, the Sea of Galilee, Magdala, and so on. So we have a question. Peter's home and family are right here in Capernaum, the Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus' ministry really started. That was his home base for his ministry. Why are there no records of Peter's evangelical activities in his home areas of the Galilee? And I would propose an answer to that is that it was in those areas that Miriam's apostolic authority prevailed. It's there that she was respected and that she was accepted by the mother of Jesus herself. Now we know, we hear from Eastern Orthodox uh, stories and legends that are quite early and well attested of Miriam and John the Apostle and of uh, the, their being in places like Rome and Ephesus. Now, the legend places Mary later in Rome, and uh, she preceded Paul to Rome. She was there before Rome, Rome, and she remained about two years after the legal judgment was rendered against Paul and forced him to depart. Uh, according to legend, she preached all over Italy and to the emperor Tiberius in about A.D. 35 to 37, and I told you a little about the legend of the Easter egg. And this is why you always see Miriam holding an egg, because supposedly the egg that she had uh, turned all kinds of colors. This is a, obviously very legendary, but that she preached to the emperor and a miracle happened, the miracle of the egg. You'll always see her holding an egg in Eastern Orthodox uh, iconography. Paul's epistle to the Romans acknowledges and I'm quoting Miriam, who has done much for us. And you'll find this in Romans 16.6. 6. This may refer to her period in Rome or to her period in Ephesus. In any case, the connection of uh, Miriam with Rome and with Ephesus has been rather well established. So probably this is the one reference we have to the ministry of Mary the Apostle um, after the times referred to the time of the resurrection in the Gospels of the New Testament. Now, uh, Peter was already martyred in the Neronian persecution of A.D. 64, so he wasn't around at this time. And the opposition to Mary had ceased at this time. And uh, so the stories of Mary's rather freely preaching in areas like Rome and then all the way back to Ephesus with John are to be taken rather seriously. She, there was, uh, she was a traveling, a wandering apostle. She was deep, uh, a deeply respected witness and considered to be a, a, a kind of founding mother of the whole movement. Now what happens to Mary Magdalene uh, in the medieval period is she is not only in the 4th, 5th century uh, wrongly associated with the repentant prostitute, and people just love that theme, I and mean, there's nothing more fun than being a repentant prostitute, but Mary Magdalene, because there are so many Miriams, uh, and for various other reasons, is conflated. Her, the idea of Mary Magdalene is conflated with... Uh, Mary of Bethany, who was a prophetess. So here we have, for example, a little iconography from the medieval period. And let's take a look at what she's got here. She has the egg. That's the Mary Magdalene egg. But she's also got the alabaster jar, the jar of the prophetess. So Mary of Magdalene becomes the all-purpose Mary. She's the anti-Mary to the Virgin Mary. She's the human Mary, the Mary in scarlet and she subsumes all the Marys of the New Testament. Now if we go back to history, we look at Miriam and John in these periods, 
In the later 60s AD, uh, there is a great diaspora of Judean Christians because they're, we're coming to the time of the siege of Jerusalem where uh, the temple will be desecrated and the walls will be broken down and the destruction of the second temple uh, is prophesied by Yeshua is going to happen. And so a lot of the Christian communities leave before this happens because he prophesied this. This, of course, later in Gentile Christian apocalyptic became uh, the apocalyptic predictions of the end of the world and all this sort of thing. But that's not what he predicted. He predicted the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem. So a lot of these people left in the, the AD 60s. And Eastern Orthodox legend places John in Rome with Miriam. And Miriam is now an aged saint. And, uh, and he is there now about AD 70, about the time of the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem. And Eastern Orthodox legend tells us then of John's arrival in Ephesus with Mary Magdalene shortly after this time. She is an elderly saint who soon dies of old age, and there are many legends about where her tomb might be and where her relics are and so on. Now, John becomes the main and major uh, respected apostle and there are other Johns. There's John the Elder and different people. But in Asia Minor, John becomes the main and uh, respected apostle. Uh, and, of course, everybody will consider him to be the greatest apostle of Jesus and so on. And John's gospel is going to be written by disciples of John. But John was an associate of Mary Magdalene. And he learned a great deal from her. And John's is the mystic gospel. John's is the mystic message. Now, in John's Gospel, the little story that's told, the little legend that is told in that Gospel and no others, is that uh, Mary Magdalene, and uh, or rather that Mary, uh, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is standing by the cross, and Jesus says, "Mother, behold thy son," uh, referring to John, the uh, apostle John, and "Son, behold thy mother." He's giving John's care over to his mother, or vice versa. And uh, in some uh, interpretations, people claim that it's really, Mother, behold thy daughter, Miriam. And it's been changed to the male uh, gender. Mother, behold thy daughter. In other words, it was Mary Magdalene's uh, was the one who took over uh, care and nurture and friendship with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, this is what I believe uh, uh, Brown claims in his analysis. So this is later confused with the mother of Jesus in Eastern Orthodox tradition because of this passage. And uh, we now have evidence that the anonymous beloved disciple who's never named in John's Gospel was not John but was Miriam, Mary of Magdala. I want to show you through that evidence. the beloved disciple of John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, the beloved disciple is always anonymous, but framed as a male, because it's he did this or he did that, and so on. It's usually assumed that it means the young apostle John, who was the youngest of all the apostles. In fact, he was maybe a 14, 15 year old boy. Now, Raymond Brown, who's an eminent Catholic scholar, argues that Mary Magdalene was the author of the fourth gospel and here's a website you can go to if you want to read about his point of view I don't uh, think that's true but I do think that her legend her apostolic tradition is uh, embedded in many of the teachings of the Johannine traditions uh, and there is a strong tradition as we know about Mary as the beloved disciple we find in, Men in the gospel of Philip and many other places uh, Esther de Boer at this current time has a dissertation in progress. She's an excellent scholar. You can find it at this website and you might want to keep up to date with the dissertation she's working on uh, about Mary as the beloved disciple in John's Gospel. So you ask, well, well why is the beloved disciple called he and him and his? Why are these 
uh, masculine gender pronouns used always when we talk about this anonymous beloved disciple. Well, as we talked about before, by the AD 100s, all references to female religious authorities were turned male. That was already happening with Paul. Uh, for example, the Holy Spirit in Aramaic is female, the Ruach HaKodesh. Well, now it's turned into uh, into Greek, which is uh, the uh, the term is uh, made into a neuter term. It's the uh, pneuma, which is now no longer feminine, but neuter. And uh, the pneuma hagion becomes the Holy Spirit neuter as a separate kind of thing. And finally, by the time it's translated into Latin in the Vulgate by St. Jerome, it becomes the Spiritus Sanctus, which is male. So here we've done a, a whole sex change operation on the Holy Spirit. She's no longer female. She's no longer feminine. She's a male. And now we have the trinity of the three guys, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, this, these these, these, these uh, kinds of tendencies are happening already in uh, religious literature and, and the literature of early Gentile Christianity. Uh, women were not considered to be worthy to teach or, pre or preach or write a gospel. This was the ad advent uh, uh, in Christianity of a new kind of asceticism, an asceticism that Yeshua would never have espoused. He was in fact criticized for being too libertine. Uh, and it's called uh, celibatarianism. And uh, where now the person who is idealized as the widow, the virgin, the one who is not married, the single man, and so on. Uh, you can learn about this by going to the website I have above, www.womenpriest.org, and so on. Now, you know that women were initially active in propagating the gospel. They were seminal in all this. And Paul states that women preached in church like men. And he states that a woman named Junia was, not, was of note among the apostles. And uh, we find the graves of women bishops and things like this. So we know that at the very beginning, uh, right after the time of Yeshua, women had a major role in not only just serving Christianity, but in uh, in promulgating it, preaching it, and uh, the creative additions to it that were made. Uh, then we know that the, in the Synod of, of Elvira, which is in the early AD 300s, decreed in Canon 81 that women should neither write nor receive letters in their own name. And finally, the Apostolic Constitutions uh, of a little bit later, quote, we do not permit women to exercise the office of teacher within the church. They are only to pray and listen to the teachers. So this marginalization of women, which was eventually a suppression of women, became a suppression also of female identity in the way that the stories were told about the early church. So the beloved disciple of John's Gospel could not very well be a woman by the time it got to be the second century because it would be uh, it would not be respected in the other areas. The woman who taught and who educated so many people, Mary of Magdala, now became known uh, as a male, as a man, the beloved. Here's an example of Mary as a beloved disciple in the fourth gospel. Jesus' side is pierced by a spear, and a testimony about this is recorded by an eyewitness. Why could this eyewitness be Mary Magdalene? Well, Simon Peter and another disciple, unnamed, who is who is given a a he, he's designated as a, as a male, followed Jesus to the house of Caiaphas where Peter publicly denied being a disciple of Jesus before the cock crew. And after this, Jesus is led to the praetorium and we hear nothing of Peter until the day that Jesus' tomb is found empty. At the crucifixion in John's Gospel, as in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, no known male disciples are mentioned as being present. They couldn't be. It would be too dangerous. They would be immediately arrested. 
In John, the anonymous other disciple, from John 18, 15 to 16, seems to be the one who remains and appears again as the disciple Jesus loved beneath the cross. And we would maintain that's Mary Magdalene. Uh, the only people who could have been there safely were women disciples or little boys. And this person, quote, whose testimony should not be doubted, is the same as the one who witnesses the sight of Jesus being pierced with a spear, quote, and at once there came out blood and water, etc. So that could not have been a man. A man could not have been present. It had been too dangerous. Possibly a young boy. It maybe could have been John as a very young boy. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows and tells the truth that you also may believe. We always assume this is John as a little boy telling what he saw. But Mary Magdalene, as the disciple Jesus loved, and the only mentioned disciple still present is the one who bore witness to this. So, first, witness to the fact that Jesus really died, and secondly, to the insight that Jesus' death indeed procured not only blood as a symbol of his gift of love, but also water as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, where Mary Magdalene in the Synoptic Gospels is witness to the fact that Jesus is really buried, here she's witness to the meaning of his death, in the same way John presents her as the key witness to the precise meaning of Jesus' resurrection. So this is the kind of argument we're going to find by Brown and other people who will say that the beloved disciple, uh, just as in many other Gospels, is Mary Magdalene, not John himself. Now, in the Johannine literature, the Johannine mysticism, there are many things that are much more mystical than what we find in the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels uh, basically present miracles as miracles and healings as healings, and uh, there is not so much allegory. The main allegory is simply allegorical interpretation of Old Testament verses to prove that Jesus is the Christ. But in the Johannine uh, story, the whole gospel is like a mystery religion. It's based on one year, the whole life of Jesus, the whole ministry, presented as one year long. It's based on the, the church year. It's obviously meant to be read in a church over the period of one year. It's a liturgical document. And it's full of mystical sermons about the meaning of Jesus as the Christ. It's not focused on the teachings of Jesus. We really can't go to John's Gospels to find the teachings of Jesus. We can only go to John's Gospel to find the mystical interpretation of the person of Jesus, the Christ. In other words, what we call Christology. And in the context of this, we find what we call not so much miracles, but semea. Each miracle is a semeon, or a divine sign. And in fact, in John's Gospel, there is kind of a derogatory uh, comments made about uh, uh, signs and wonders. It's uh, actually these signs are meant to teach people. They're things that educate you about spiritual realities. <coughs> now, we know of the Magdalenic uh, confusion or association in the medieval legend of Mary Magdala with uh, Mary of Bethany. Uh, in this, in John's stories, however, uh, Mary of Bethany is, is represented as who she is and, and Martha and so on and Mary of Magdala is represented as who she is and they have a brother Mary uh, of Bethany has a brother named Lazarus and Lazarus is raised from the dead why don't we hear the Lazarus story in the Synoptic Gospels I would suggest that it is because it is a mystical story that is about the deeper mysteries, such as might have been found in the secret gospel of Mark, were we able to find the whole thing instead of just one little passage. That in Asia Minor, this was the repository of the Christian mysteries, just as it was in Alexandria. And that the story of Lazarus had a very deep symbolic meaning about the resurrection of individuals not only after life but in life that one can be resurrected in life to become a saint and uh, 
so I would maintain that the story of the raising of Lazarus is an association with what I would call the Magdalenic apostolic gnosis. And as we look at the Gospel of Mary in the third module, we see why this sort of thing would relate to that kind of mysticism. Now, as we look at the development of church leadership in Ephesus, I'm going to uh, take uh, some bits and pieces from Raymond Brown's uh, Community the Beloved Disciple to uh, give us an idea of what we think might have been the development of that community which was founded by earlier apostles and then the people who came in and, and brought it together, solidified it and made it powerful uh, in Ephesus and Asia Minor were uh, Mary Magdalene, now an old woman, and the Apostle John, a, now a man in the, in the full strength of his years. He envisions a first stage, the mid-50s uh, to late 80s, and uh, there is a group already there, but uh, he m imagines Mary Magdalene as the originating group of the community in Ephesus, which may or may not be correct. I think there's some evidence that there was a, quite a community there before she came. But she is highly esteemed as the primary witness to the resurrection of Christ, and that's what it's all about, folks. She's recognized as such even by believers who do not belong to this particular community, and she's known very early on as the companion of Jesus, and that's the word in Greek. Uh, it would be like the twin of Jesus uh, in Thomas's tradition. <coughs> And she's known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. An essential part of the proclamation of uh, uh, Mary and John, their proclamation of the gospel, is the fact that Mary Magdalene was the first to see the risen Christ. Now a second stage, about uh, maybe 80, 80 to 90, at this point the community has a version of their gospel, either written or oral, which includes the tradition that Mary Magdalene was their founder, hero, and leader. And Mary Magdalene is probably deceased by this time. In fact, she's undoubtedly deceased by this time. There's a schism in the community. And this is probably the result of an internal dis dispute about the Christology, the high Christology that they have developed about Jesus as the Christ. The community is divided into two groups, which uh, Brown likes to call the secessionists and the apostolic Christians. And in this third stage, which con brings us into the beginning of the first century, the apostolic Christians, um, as the church becomes a more organized institution, this group is fearful of ostracism and persecution. Why? They want to seek amalgamation with the leaders of the emerging institutional churches in other areas. And they're, they're circulating writings and they're getting the writings of the other churches, etc. And the claim that a female disciple of Jesus had been their community's first leader and hero quickly becomes an embarrassment in the patriarchal world of the Hellenistic uh, Christians. They need to obscure that fact if they are to be accepted by the male leadership of the growing organized church. And so an editor, a redactor, in this community reworks their gospel in order to make it consistent with this obscuration. <coughs> The result of this redaction is the canonical fourth gospel as we have it today. This is Brown's idea. And so all the references to Mary, she, her, and her witness becomes he, him, and his witness. Now the secessionists are the largest of the two groups and they hold on to their tradition which cites Mary Magdalene as a beloved disciple of Jesus. And many members of this community take this tradition to various Gnostic groups. Their identification of Mary Magdalene as the disciple whom Jesus loved is reflected in the Gnostic Christian writings of Nag Hammadi, for example, the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Mary. Uh, and, uh, and the Johannite tradition, which uh, continues as the anti-tradition against the uh, Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Church later on, which survives, uh, re, uh, continues these kinds of traditions as well. So I'll make some comments on that. Asia Minor was the location of the Montanist movement in the 2nd to 3rd century, which was led by women, female prophetesses, Prissa and Maximilla, 
Where did they get their skills? Where did they get their idea that women could be leaders if this has already been X'd out a century ago? Because it was part of the secessionist group, the original Johannine Christians. And so they uttered inspired, inspired things from the Holy Spirit and led this movement. Uh, Phrygia, by the way, where this happened, was a location of, of many of the Hellenistic ecstatic mysteries, but also the place where Johannite churches were founded by Mary Magdalene. And so the idea of prophecy was well established in the community, and Mary Magdalene probably did a great deal of prophecy and prophetic writing and teaching. So we have to ask, was Mary also a visionary seer and one who uttered prophetic words from the Ruach HaKodesh? Was she a prophetess? And my answer would be, of course, absolutely, just like Mary of Bethany. Now, the Johannite church remained legendary in that region. Uh, this came from what Browns calls his secessionist church. It was the inspiration for monastic mystics that abounded in that area and youth who later fled from the uh, Byzantine National Church Orthodoxy to the deserts of Egypt after the established religion had uh, become uh, a matter of uh, ascetic males and buildings and they established the first colonies of the desert fathers and they came mostly from these regions and it became the anti-church to the Byzantine Eastern Orthodoxy and we call it the Johannite Church now according to some traditions uh, that we have the the it meant much later in the medieval period uh, a bishop I believe it was Theophilus of the Johannite tradition passed on the episcopate he made a bishop out of the founders of the Knights Templar and passed that tradition on uh, the charter of Larmenius uh, which is disputed but I think many scholars now would regard it as authentic it was written in Greek is a Templar document held in Vatican archives and was examined by Matter and Levy and others who concluded it was authentic, but later people uh, disputed that with them because they just couldn't believe it was true. But it seemed that into the Knights Templar came apostolic succession through the, uh, the dying out uh, Johannite Church of Asia Minor. And the Johannic Gnostics under the patriarch uh, Theocletus, that was his name, Theocletus, transmitted their traditions and their succession from St. John the Divine to uh, Hugh de Pan, who was a grand master of the Templars, in the year 1154, according to the, the uh, Charter of Larminius. And this became part of the esoteric and heretical uh, Christian stream in Europe, the underground currents in Europe, the anti- papal currents, uh, the secret religion of the Templars, who apparently possessed the Mandelian, which we now know today as the Shroud of Turin, and many other traditions that were not considered to be orthodox or correct or would be considered to be heretical by uh, papist forces. Uh, the Merovingian legends of the Holy Blood uh, were not part of this, but that was part of the mix in Europe, and so these, this reverence for Mary Magdalene and her mystical traditions was not part of this Merovingian Legends of the Holy Blood. But there was a parallel development of Marian sects in Europe, those that were associated with the Merovingian Holy Blood thing and so on, and those that were more in line with uh, what the Templars probably brought through. Uh, and along with that, uh, there were the cults of the Hindu goddess Kali, brought in by the gypsies in the ninth century, uh, the so-called cults of the Black Virgin. The gypsies were not from Egypt, they were from India. And uh, they were always happy to tell you they were from Egypt because it was very romantic and everything, but they were protected by the Bogomiles and by the uh, Prussian uh, government and certain people. And later on in Scotland, uh, at Rosalind Chapel and so on, uh, but they were very much often persecuted, but they brought with them their worship of Kali, which became the worship of the Black Virgin, which was considered to be uh, a worship of uh, that was related to Magdalenic worship, not, however, uh, worship of Mary Magdalene as a progenitor of the Merovingians, because this is the Black Virgin. 
<coughs> and then there were Saint Magdalen cults, such as we find that in France, uh, about Saint Magdalene who was uh, fed on the Eucharist by angels and all this sort of thing. Not a Mary Magdalene that bore any child, but she just was a saint. And then there were the Virgin Mother of Christ cults that also uh, occurred. So we have uh, this whole development going on in, in Europe and European tradition. This is the end of Module 2. Module 3 will give us a look at the uh, the esoteric content of the Gospel of Mary.